And welcome back to the Digital Education Station, everyone. I'm Ryan Ferran, the Chief Communications Officer for the Arcadia Unified School District. We are talking UDL today, Universal Design for Learning, and we have two very special guests joining us in the Digital Education Station today. We are thrilled you guys are here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So I'll give you the official introduction. We have Liz Byron and Joni Degner, expert trainers from CAST talking all about UDL. So you guys are actually here today training our staff for mm -hmm. two days. We just completed day one, which was fantastic by the way. So thank okay. you very much. Thanks. So these videos, as we were talking before we came on, are for our parents, students, staff, people that are just kind of wanting to know what we're doing in our school district, in our classrooms. We kind of give them behind the scenes so they have more information about how their child's being educated and for our staff, what's happening throughout the rest of the district. So this is a great opportunity for us to bring in the expert trainers who are training our staff, who will train others uh, to give them that information. So first question, I guess, is what in the heck is UDL? Uh, I know it's a vast, great thing that a lot of our teachers are already implementing some of them. What is UDL? Well, Universal Design for Learning is a framework for teaching where teachers uh, write a clear goal with flexible means, you identify learning barriers, and then you proactively plan using the guidelines, the Universal Des Design for Learning guidelines, mm -hmm. to reduce or remove those instructional barriers. Okay, very, would you add anything yeah. to that? That's pretty yeah, succinct. Yeah, I would just say like, it's, a, it's a framework that, that acknowledges and honors the fact that we all come to learning differently. Mm -hmm. That what engages you is not the same thing that engages me. And what sustains your interest and makes you feel like you're appropriately challenged is not the same thing that, that makes me feel appropriately challenged. Mm -hmm. And that we all take in information and attach meaning to information in different ways. That we all see ourselves using learning in different ways. And that we all reach our greatest potential in different ways, like mm -hmm. through different kinds of action and expression. And so so it really is a framework that, that, that optimizes teaching and learning um, and, and, and kind of honors the fact that we all come to a learning experience as very different people. So in the past few years in Arcadia, we've been talking a lot about student voice and choice. Mm -hmm. And having gone through the day with you guys today, I know that is right in UDL's alley, voice and choice. So how does that kind of work with UDL and giving students some more voice and some more choice in their learning. Well, I think uh, UDL is broken down into three principles, one being the engagement, why am I interested in doing this? So that's really where student voice would come in. What is interesting to them? Um, how can I tie in rigorous standards to something that's culturally relevant for them? And then that choice, the autonomy, have, and having options within your instruction, providing multiple means for the what you're gonna teach okay. so that I know when I'm planning a lesson, I have more than one way for kids to learn the content, and then more than one way for them to show what they've learned. So that in involves choice just naturally. And it's so important, we see it all the time, and we have these names for it now, whether it's voice and chores, UDL, personalized learning, whatever it is, but it goes back to what educators have been doing for since the beginning of time, is getting your kid interested in learning and wanting, being engaged and wanting to be in the classroom. So this is like about the kids not engaged, let's get them enjoying learning and figuring that sort of thing out. So Joni, how would this kind of look like and translate into a classroom lesson with a teacher and a student? Yeah, so as Liz said, like universal design for learning really starts out with a clear goal with flexible means, which means that, well, I want everybody to be, to meet the same high expectations, right? So there's this, this saying that kind of resonates in the field of UDL that it's not about lowering the bar, mm -hmm. it's about lowering barriers. Right? So it's not about changing expectations and lowering expectations. UDL really is about like, how do we make sure learning is rigorous for everyone? So it starts out with a clear goal, flexible means. I build on those flexible means so that I can make sure that, um, for instance, if, if I want everyone to write a persuasive essay, nice. um, the truth is it might seem like, well, that's pretty fixed. Like there's one way to get there. But the truth is, like, that might be the work we're doing, but there are lots of different techniques for writing a persuasive essay. Mm -hmm. And so my students might have some different pathways to take in their technique to get there. 
right? Um, they might have some choices in terms of their tools and their resources that they use. They may even have a choice of, 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 of independent work or co-authoring with someone else because that's a completely different skill set, right? To collaborate and co-author. Mm -hmm. And so it really is about um, if I'm going to give those choices to my learners, then I also have to coach them into making those choices, mm -hmm. right? And get their feedback on those choices so that I know which ones are working and which ones really aren't mm -hmm. working. Right. One thing that I like that you guys said today in the training for us to clarify was it's not ultimate voice and choice. There's parameters and mm -hmm. some Absolutely. areas you give choice and some there's yeah. no choice. Mm -hmm. So kind of explain that for parents because there's always that misconception, well, my kid hates public speaking, then he can just do a video for every single assignment however he wants yeah. to do it. So kind of talk about the parameters, how much voice and choice they get and how much the teacher kind of dictates in that balance. So it's actually not always about choice because, I mean, let's be honest, if we are really preparing our learners for whatever comes after school, whether that is a, a, a community college, a, a four-year college, and you know, followed by a master's program, or whether that's an apprenticeship in a workplace um, or, or, or a vocational track, mm -hmm. for whatever we're preparing them for, there are some things you're gonna have to do, <laughs> and you don't have a choice in it. Which means that we have to make sure that our learners then are able to reach those goals. So at that point, it becomes about scaffolding. So if we go to your example about, about public speaking, mm -hmm. okay, so well, how can I scaffold you up to where you are able to deliver a three to five minute speech for your classmates, mm -hmm. right? Maybe that's not where we begin. Maybe we begin with the video, right? Mm -hmm. You can record the video and you can send it to me and I'll give you some feedback on it. Mm -hmm. That's a starting point, but that's not where we begin and end, right? Because if ultimately I want you to be able to, to do public speaking mm -hmm. in some way, then I might say, great, so then like the next thing we're gonna build up to would be like, maybe you could could um, could do your, your public speaking um, practice then for a small group, mm -hmm. or just for oh, me, gotcha. right? Like during lunch mm -hmm. or my prep period or after school, and I'll give you some feedback, like you'll do it live. Mm -hmm. And then you, like you work up mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not about lowering expectations about like, well, I know you don't like public speaking, so you can just do videos. Right. Right. That's not what we're doing, right? We're gotcha. figuring out like, how do we get everybody there? Mm -hmm. Not lowering those expectations, we're gonna build people up mm -hmm. to them so everybody can mm -hmm. reach those expectations. Mm -hmm. And part of UDL with this example would be also to acknowledge the um, social and emotional components of public speaking. So how are we going to help you cope with, what are, is it, your anxiety, your fears, so that you can feel confident mm -hmm. eventually doing it in front of a group of people. But it's also a component of learning that we sometimes overlook. And Universal Design for Learning is grounded in cognitive neuroscience and research, which mm -hmm. kind of separates itself a lot from other frameworks or initiatives for teaching mm -hmm. because it is so research bit backed. And when we think about any type of learning, acknowledging the uh, affective components of mm -hmm. it, and if a student, if his goal is to do public speaking, doing all that scaffolding and bringing in the affective component and, and providing those skills and places for discussing, talking about working through um, the social and emotional um, requirements for doing that. What are you talking about? Everyone loves public speaking, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. You're scaffolding, you're building confidence, and you're ultimately going to do it, but there's some ways to get more engagement, some more confidence, yeah. and then get them to the ultimate yes. goal. Right. I mean, ultimately, like, if I'm going to go, if I want to run a marathon, I don't run 26 miles on the first day. Right. That's right? true. That doesn't mean I'm not a runner. Right. And that doesn't mean I'm not going to run the marathon. Yeah. Like, I've got to work up right. to it. Yeah. Right. And so what I like too, you guys showed us this great infographic and we'll pull it up for the people at home to see too, is the guidelines mm -hmm. for UDL to take us kind of a, a next level. So kind of walk us through what the guidelines look like and more about what they are. Sure. So that very top row of the guidelines really is like the, it's kind of the backbone. Um, in fact, when UDL began, it was just those three principles, those three overarching ideas that everybody needs multiple means of engagement because we come to learning in different ways. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs multiple means of representation because we take in and, and process and categorize and make sense of information in different ways. And that everybody needs multiple means of action expression because we all um, ex express you know, what we know in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so it actually began with those three overarching principles that support those three brain networks. Um, and it was only years later, you know, when, when practitioners like me and Liz said, 
yeah, but what's it look like? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, we, the, the people came in the field kind of began pushing, and then and then here came the guidelines. Um, and within those guidelines, then you have checkpoints, and I always think of those checkpoints as being like. Um, you know, it's like the teacher next door saying, well, have you tried something like mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to be doing all of those checkpoints in order to be universally designing. It really is not about three principles and nine guidelines and 31 checkpoints. It really is about building in the, the, the flexibility and the accessibility to say, I acknowledge that we all come to this differently and, and I'll, I'll proactively remove as many barriers as I can possibly conceive of. Mm -hmm. Knowing that, of course, like, I won't, I won't think of all of them, mm -hmm. but that, that I'll be dedicated to removing barriers for all my learners. Mm -hmm. What else should we know about the guidelines, Liz? For I think it's resulting in expert learning mm -hmm. is the capstone where if we truly, over the course of a child's education, provide them with these options for learning and being engaged, then they become expert learners within each of the three principles. They're purposeful and motivated, they're knowledgeable and resourceful, and they're strategic and goal-directed, and that's what we want for all of our kids. But they're not going to get there unless we really shift the way we've been teaching. And so just so people have reference of your experience for both of you, you're both teachers, educators, you're in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So we probably should have done this at the beginning, my fault, but okay, give us some ac about your background and how you got into this and why you're so passionate about it and now how you're with CAST. Yeah. Well, I, I'm entering my 13th year as a Boston public school teacher and I've taught every subject from preschool through high school, almost every subject minus science. Um, and I went into UDL, I was a special education teacher, so getting my students more access to the general curriculum was important, but mm -hmm. then I also became a full inclusion teacher where now I just teach uh, whole large classrooms and I have a very wide variability of students in my classroom because I have gifted and talented kids and I have kids who um, have uh, very modified assessments and mm -hmm. very specific needs. So I needed something where I could create one really strong lesson instead of creating 10 different packets mm -hmm. to differentiate all your learning. So that's how I got into it. And so I started out as a high school language arts teacher mm -hmm. and I was lucky enough to land on Columbus, Indiana at um, a, a school district, um, Bartholomew Consolidated School Corporation that has a long-standing relationship with CAST as one of their, you know, like the first um, uh, longitudinal implementation sites. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I, I sort of got lucky when I, when I came there um, because I was um, at a place in my career where the, the learner variability was widening mm -hmm. and I was, I was quite honestly struggling like, to keep up. And it wasn't just kids who were struggling. I had several sections of AP um, seniors in my language arts courses, and those were students who's like, the, you can't get the challenge optimized mm -hmm. enough for them, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, because they just, they, they eat it up and they're hungry for more. Right. And so it wasn't just kids who were struggling, like in my freshman classes, it was also kids who were on the high end, and I'm always looking for how do I build in greater challenge? How do I build in greater challenge? And so, um, and then from there, I transitioned into a role in, of teacher support. Um, so I was a teacher using the framework, and then I transitioned into a role of teacher support. So um, in my own home district every day, uh, I'm doing some kind of professional learning, and sometimes it's one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. uh, like planning with a teacher. Sometimes it's the kind of work we did with your staff today, mm -hmm. like larger group stuff. Um, and then I also do work with CAST. Um, so I go out across the country and, and do work like the work that we've done together today. But I like it's, what you brought um, up too about it's not just about the lower achieving students, it's tough for teachers. How do I engage the high achieving mm -hmm. students that are falling asleep because they mastered this three years I gotta ago? I got to be honest with you, the, one of the things I shared with your staff today is that I think that in public education, well in private education, in education in general, mm -hmm. I think we've been very good at creating situations where students know how to play school and be mm -hmm. compliant. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that when they leave us then, um, and they're not expected to play school, they're expected to think for themselves and to innovate and to make choices. Mm -hmm. Which is why we talk about we need to coach kids into making great choices for their learning now and create mm -hmm. situations where they're becoming expert learners now mm -hmm. because when they leave us, 
compliance is really not what people are much looking for anymore. Like workplaces are changing so drastically that our students need to be able to be agile enough to mm -hmm. learn new skills and to know how they best learn, mm -hmm. right? And that when they go into um, a, when they go on to um, a, 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 a post-secondary education course, that they know um, how to be purposeful in their, in their learning. Like they know how to stick with it even when it's hard. Mm -hmm. And that when they don't know something, they know how to chase down the resources to get it. They, they, they recognize strategies that don't work. They know when to revise a strategy when it's not working for them. And that they know how to stay goal directed. Like if this is the thing they want to achieve, like they know how to remove barriers for themselves. I mean, that's really what we're doing is yeah. trying to model it so that they'll do it for themselves when they leave. So you might have a kid who's doing great now, but if you're making all the choices for that kid now, they're gonna struggle when they leave. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to set kids up for success for when they leave us. You guys are both so passionate and advocates for UDL. But Liz, I know you weren't always from day one. Right, convinced. I wasn't at all. Tell us about that and yeah. how, you, how you became eventually convinced. Um, I initially started learning about UDL, took a course from David Rose, one of the founding creators of UDL. And while what I learned was uh, you know, valuable, I pushed back so hard because to me, I'm like, this is just good teaching and I don't have these resources and it's way too much for me as a teacher. <laughs> so I went back into the classroom and I just ignored it, the thought of it, and I differentiated and I, I had different groupings for students and tried to get students to move and, and academically and learn. It was exhausting and overwhelming. And then my principal eventually said, you should take a class on UDL. And I was like, oh, I already did, but okay, I'll do it. I took it. And then I actually started small, implementing the framework really just within the physical classroom design mm -hmm. of my space, which is part of the learning environment. And it became a structure where I could, that was sustainable. I came in every day and the structure was mm -hmm. there. And then I started embedding really low ask, um, easy, so not easy, but simple ways to provide students with meaningful options to access a goal. Um, nothing that was um, unattainable and it became sustainable because I was starting small and then over time it just snowballed. And I immediately saw the impact after day one, after wow. I, I, I redesigned the classroom space to make learning more accessible and provide options for seating, an option for small group work and, and redesigning like how I labeled things. So there was a picture in uh, the text in two languages. So it took away the barrier of having to read, where do I put this crayon? There is a bin with a picture of crayons, but mm -hmm. also a, with text. So yeah. it doesn't mean removing text from everything. Mm -hmm. and. It, it was so drastic after just day one that I slowly started gradually continuing to grow my practice and implementing the framework within my teaching. And the cool thing about UDL, it can seem overwhelming, but if you can imagine it's never done, like you're never done removing barriers mm -hmm. and redesigning the learning environment and the learning instruction because there will always be some level of barrier, but you can, so you can grow infinitely. It's something I can do for the rest of my career, um, both in my personal life and in my classroom. So for our teachers who are out there watching this that weren't here today, and they're kind of like, I'm interested in UDL, yeah. how do I start implementing? What would be your advice to yeah. somebody just starting to implement it in their classroom? Mm -hmm. Learn um, about the guidelines, the very general, the the framework, w the three principles, and then start small. There's loads of resources on the CAST website. We've provided the teachers here today with lots of resources to take back to their schools. They have they have them, but also start small. Name one actionable step, one way you can provide your students with an option for engagement or an option for what you're teaching, the content, mm -hmm. or an option for how they're gonna show what they know, and start small. And then when that's comfortable, continue. Because if it gets overwhelming, then yeah. you immediately just back off. Yeah. So are you guys ready to go bowling? Yeah, let's go bowling. <laughs> okay. So we're, we'll all watch this together, but give us a little setup of what this, who this per person is and their perspective on, on UDL and this strategy. So Shelly Moore is going to be speaking, I believe when she made this video, she was a doctoral candidate and she's mm -hmm. talking about inclusive practices, but also making the comparison of how un universal design for learning is like bowling and how bowling is like education. And she makes this great analogy that really brings to life everything we've just said. Okay. So we'll watch this, then we'll come back, comment, and then we'll wrap it all up. Okay, great. Sounds great. great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shelly Moore and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. As Canadians, we have a reputation for finding and embracing the strength in our diversity. 
This value, however, hasn't been reflected in our classrooms, which still segregates students by ability, especially students with developmental disabilities. There's a gap in our understanding about what we know inclusive education to be, philosophically, versus what we understand and the importance of understanding inclusion in our practice. This is the question I'm trying to answer in my research, is how can we find the value in the day-to-day -day practice in our classrooms in terms of inclusive education? So how am I gonna explain this to you? Now I can sit here and try and describe this, or we could have a little bit more fun. Why don't we go bowling? So let's talk about bowling. You have 10 pins, you have two balls, and you have a lane. The goal is to knock down as many pins as you can. But if you don't get them all, it's okay, because you have another chance. But when I bowl and roll the ball down the middle, and I don't knock them all down, what often ends up happening to me is that there's two pins left standing on either end, and they stare at you. It's the 7-10 split, and it's the hardest shot in bowling. How is bowling like teaching? The ball was the lesson, the pins are the kids. We aim for the middle, we do the best we can. The pins that are left standing, we often have another chance to kind of get to them, but at the end of the day, those two pins that are staring looking at you are kids who need the most support and are kids who need the most challenge. So we end up choosing one, and the other one is left standing. I just took all the fun out of bowling. Now, I don't know how many times you've watched professional bowling, but I spent an afternoon watching professional bowling, and let me tell you, there was not one bowler who rolled that ball down the middle of the lane. They throw the ball down the lane at a curve. And I was actually really curious about this, so I called up a professional bowler. He was so excited. I don't think he gets a lot of calls about education. He said the reason why the ball has to enter at a curve is because you will knock down more pins and create a bigger domino effect if you enter at that angle. But in order to do that, you have to change your aim. In order to knock down the most pins with one shot, he aims for the pins that are the hardest to hit. Now let's just let this sink in for a second. We are taught to teach the head pins. We are not taught to teach to the kids who are the furthest and the hardest to get to. The kids with autism, the kids with Down syndrome. The part that's critical here, and it really aligns with universal design for learning, is that so often, the supports that we design for those kids on the outside of the lane are actually supports that all of the kids need. This is the part we need to understand if inclusive education is going to move forward in Canada. How can we find this value of diversity in our classrooms between the students? This is not just important for the outside pens, but it's critical for every single one of us. And just think, all we need to do is change our aim. Look how bowling changed education. The dreaded 7-10 split. Mm -hmm. If anyone's bold, they, they've gotten it and it's terrible to get. So Shelley does a great job of it, putting that in perspective, the great bowling analogy. Um, and it's true, when you think bowling, if you go for the first time, you're just aiming straight, then you realize that you gotta come in at a curve, different angle, different approach. Mm -hmm. What would you add to that insightful piece from Shelley? I actually think getting the ball to go at a curve is really hard, so the teacher is the bowler. And, and that lesson, the, is, it's hard to create that curve. And that's why I love U UDL, because it has a framework. I have resources I can go to, like I said, the CAST website and, and my colleagues. And once, once you get into the mindset of planning for barriers to reduce and remove them in the learning environment and within my instruction, getting the ball to go at a curve as a teacher is so much more attainable. Mm -hmm. But like if I go bowling right now, I can't get it to go at a curve because I don't have that skill set. But mm -hmm. over time, growing your understanding and implementation of UDL, the ball starts, I mean, I don't have strikes every lesson, <laughs> but the ball starts going at a curve uh, a lot more frequently. Once in a while we throw a gutter ball, but then we put in those uh, yeah. bumper bumper balls, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. or I get feedback in. from my students. I'm like, why was that a, a gutter ball? And we're talking about what went <coughs> well and what didn't and, and how we can uh, reiterate the the lesson so that learning the learning outcomes are what we'd hope. And for people that don't know what CAST is, mm -hmm. it is a nonprofit education research and development organization that works to expand learning opportunities for all individuals mm -hmm. through UDL. And the website is mm -hmm. CAST.org. Mm -hmm. So that's a great resource. Any yes. other resources that people can go to for more information? Absolutely. So um, Arcadia Unified is, is lucky enough that in um, October you'll have um, our my dear friend Katie Novak um, uh, with you. And Katie has um, one of the breath practitioner books I think out there. There are actually several fantastic practitioner books that I would recommend to anyone. Um, and Katie's book UDL Now is kind of like 
like a staple for yes. practitioners, yes. I think. Um, and um, along with um, Louis Lord Nelson's book, uh, Design and Deliver, Louis was actually a UDL facilitator at my school district, one of the first in my school district to be a UDL facilitator. Um, and she's a, a dear colleague of ours now. Um, and the other one that I would highly recommend is Dive Into UDL from Louise Perez and Kendra Grant. Um, those three books, UDL Now, Design and Deliver, and Dive Into UDL, mm -hmm. They are, um, they're quite digestible, very actionable, very practical. They've got very strong practitioner voices and they're just some of my absolute favorites. And then cast.org has a bunch of other videos. Cast.org more books. Cast.org has got, they've lots. Yeah. yeah, there's okay. there's lots of resources, but <laughs> those three are go to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything else that we should know before we uh, wrap it up? I mean, I think for your audience, as you start to understand what UDL is and what it looks like in the classroom, it's something that happens in your entire life, inside and outside of the classroom, whether you're a teacher or not. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the beauty of beauty of this, mm -hmm. is that it's not isolated to the classroom. I think for parents too, yeah. it's important to know that like this looks and feels different than, than the experience that we had in school. Yes. And for a lot of us, um, like our teachers were bowlers that, that went right down the middle. And for yeah. a lot of us, we were left standing and, and, and we somehow survived, not because the, the, the instructional design was so great, but because like we're survivors, right? Mm -hmm. And so like we didn't always thrive because the design was so great. Um, we thrived in spite of it. Yeah. Um, and when we know better, we do better. And we know more now yes. about the brain than we've ever known. And so even when you when you have a, a district that's really high performing, you have to ask yourself, what can we be doing better for our mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. right? And how do we create students who are expert mm -hmm. learners yes. so that they don't just succeed here when they're with us, but that we know that they're flourishing when they leave us. Yeah, and in the end with UDL, we're teaching kids really how to think, not the what to think. We're not filling their brains with information. Yeah, we're creating Mindset. innovators. We yeah. want our kids to be innovators. That's what we're all about in Arcadia too. So that's this great. has been fantastic. Great. Joni and Liz, thank you guys so much for stopping by the Digital Our Education Thank Station. you so much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, for more information, check out cast.org. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Great. It.